Welcome to How to Rock the Stage Show, a show committed to equipping you to hone your media skills better to stand out from the crowd as a go-to expert in your field. Each week, Rich Montreger interviews top leaders, influencers, authors, speakers, podcasters, and media professionals about how to leverage media best to help you shine brighter on camera and stage as a go-to expert. Now, here's your host, The Trigger, Rich Montreger. Welcome back once again, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., and we are back for Rock to Stage Show. Great to have you with us here tonight. And tonight, we're going to delve into how you can be a high-performance achiever, how you can have fun, and how you can avoid burnout all at the same time. Did you know that was possible? Do you know you can actually do it? Tonight, our guest is an international expert, and she's going to help us with that and get into it. And also, stick around for the very end tonight. She's brought a free gift just for you. But you got to stay to the very end because we're going to have a great time and a great show. So stick around for Rock the Stage tonight. We do want to thank our sponsor, Adavita Studios. Adavita is the one that powers our show and converts us into an audio podcast. But they can do the same thing for you. They have an experienced team paired with their state-of-the-art remote recording process. And it brings your message to life even faster. It brings it to the market even faster. They work with you to produce your audiobook, your podcast series, and distribute it out to the marketplace if you want to learn more about Adavita, go to adavita.com. That's adavita.com. So tonight, it's all about sustaining high performance while avoiding burnout. I know that's a big topic. We've all faced it. We've all struggled with it. But tonight, my guest, who is with us live tonight, is one of the first women's water polo players in the entire world. She's a pioneer. She's the captain of the Brazilian national water polo team and played professionally in Italy. After her third world championship, she was named among the best players in the world. Now, she's had a career after that. Chris has enjoyed 25 years as an executive of a leading Brazilian bank. She's leveraged her sports experience into helping people lead strong teams and realize their full potential. Chris is also a certified happiness trainer and a scholar in the first master's program in the science of happiness. Welcome to Rock the Stage tonight, Chris Pincelio. I'm going to see if I got it right or not. Chris, did I get it right? Almost, Rich. Cristiana <laughs> Pinciroli. Almost. <laughs> Pinciroli. You know, Perfect. My, my tongue's going to roll better and better the longer we hang out together. <laughs> Perfect. It's a pleasure being here with you, Trigger. You and all the team from, from Rock the Stage Show. Well, thank you for being with us. And again, um, I come out of the sports world background, so it's always fun to talk about sports. But you achieved something. You, you really did before you get into business and everything else. Water polo is not one of those household games or sports people talk about. But there was a time when it did rise. And you were part of that rise. You helped bring it around to something we did care about. Tell us a little about that. How, how did you first get into the sport and the, the whole rise to success? Well, Rich, my father is an Olympian player. We say when someone has been in the Olympic Games, he's always is an Olympian. So he's an Olympian. He went to Tokyo Olympic Games in 1964 and Mexico in 1968, and he played water polo. And water polo at that time was only a main sport. But I am the oldest daughter, the only woman. I have two brothers. But he never left me out of any conversation. He always uh, had me on his laps and listening passionately for all his stories about what it meant high-performing sport and how he thought for his life to be a better executive, a better person, a better parent. And this inspired me, the passion for sport, in general, for the water, and lastly, for water polo. Now, water polo is a very physical game. My my older brother played it, and you're, you're, you're pulling, you're shoving, you're diving, you're throwing. That's probably one of the most physical sports you can play, is it? It is. Water polo, I usually say, is like a martial art. You learn, yes, there is a lot of contact, and you learn how to position yourself, how to position your body, uh, how to be closer to the opponent. So all of this is like a game, like in soccer. 
you learn, you become better uh, after you, are, you, you gain experience in the game. What, and if, what's your greatest memory from the championship, from, from all the many games? I'm, I'm sure there's got to be one game that sticks out like the best of the best. I remember when it was one of the first times that Brazil made it to participate in a world championship. It was something which we arrived, we saw all those players that uh, many of them were professional already, and we were traveling for the first time, following our dream to become a competitive team in the world. So we arrived in Australia for our first world championship. I was 18 years old by that time. And I remember the emotion of me getting to there, into the arena, the top competitive arena and doing, being among the best in the world. So this was something that I really felt that it was much more than the results we were aiming to achieve. It was the process that I wanted to be there. It was the joy that I felt when I practiced the sport, was uh, the connectiveness among the team players, the audience, the families that were there watching. And I really felt for the first time the power of having a purpose in life. Well, and let's talk about that purpose for a second because you did break the gender equality. Water polo was pretty much a male dominant game and here you come, you rise, your team rises, three national championships. You broke the male-female gap. What's it like to be a part of that history? This was a dream coming true, you know. Uh, Rich wasn't something that at first you could see. So the first time when I started, I was 15 years old, when I learned there was a women's water polo that started being played in the world. So I remember I arrived at my club team and we decided let's start a group, bring many swimmers. I used to swim as well. And funny story that a lot of ballerinas got interested in playing water polo. Uh, so they say it's like a, our leg movement is like a ballet movement, the leg beater, how it's called. And then we started uh, creating a dream how first we could become a team and how we could develop the team over Brazil. Then uh, I have a lot of the support of my mom who became the first director of women's water polo because of the passion she felt on me. So she said, like a mom, I needed to support my daughter's dream. And later on, it was our dream for gender equality for the Olympic Games. So women's water polo, just got accepted as an official sport in the Olympic Games in Sydney, 2000, exactly one century after the men's. Wow. Yes. Wow. One century after. And you were a big part of that. And then you go from sport into banking, into business, and then you launch your own company called We Team. So you, you haven't given up on sport, but you brought sport into business, right? Yes. I've been always been passionate about high performance. So this was something, Rich, that always intrigued me. How a situation that is the same can have different impact in people. So I remember before listening to the national item, uh, I would listen to that and I would feel a lot of courage, uh, pride, when I was listening to that, and I had some teammates that they felt very emotional. They would lose their concentration before a game. So I remember this high performance business it started to attract me. I said, how we can create the co conditions to realize human potential individually and collectively. So this was something I skill that I, I learned a lot when I was the captain of women's water polo, when I played professional in Italy. And I brought these skills, this mindset, this knowledge to the financial world when I had a career of 23 years and then creating my own company that's called We Team, that exactly we leverage on the collaboration. Uh, I love the phrase that the, the human biggest strength is another human. 
So team is so important in everything you do because team requires you to work together, pull together, fight together, love together. It's, it, it, it gets messy with team, but also high success does happen. So what are some of the important aspects of team sport into team business? What are some of the overlays that you can teach us? In a sport, we have the best team when we bring out the strengths from every player. And we have a stronger team when we have a diverse team. So everyone with its own expertise, we can say an offense, a defense, a person that is more playing the center, she can distribute, for instance, the ball better. But also we have those people that are more outgoing, those that are more intra, uh, they observe better, they listen better. So all these skills, how we can create to become complementary towards the common goal. So this was the beauty that I learned in sport, in water polo, that I took later on to the financial, to the corporate world, how we can bring out the best, the strengths of each player to create a stronger team. Well, and the interesting thing about sport and like water polo being an international sport now, it's universal. You can use sport terminology, techniques, and concepts, and it is global. I mean, you are Brazilian. I'm American, but everyone can understand the concepts. Do you think that helps you lead business companies well, that it is universal? Rich, with no doubt. This is exactly what I've been focusing a lot. I wrote the book, as you can see here, Sport, a Stage for Life, how we can learn from high-performance sport and bring these skills, this knowledge for, uh, I call, a sustainable high performance. How we can combine excellency with the science of happiness to create, a, bring well-being, a fulfilling journey in a setting of how, in realizing human potential. So the examples from sport make it clear what we need to work on, not lead to burnout. So burnout's a big thing. And people are coming back out of pandemic. People were working 24 seven, seven days a week all the time because they had nothing else to do. But as we've come back out of pandemic, at least here in the States, people have realized we should never do that again because they were getting burned out. They didn't realize it. So how do you balance fun, work, sport, high achieving goals and not burn out? How do you do that? You know, Rich, this was the question that I had when I became head of human resources for this uh, is the largest Brazilian bank. When I was transferred to the United States, I started seeing back in Brazil and then in the United States, a lot of burnout in, the, in a setting that we call with pride, high performance setting. So how we can, yes, bring out the best in people but without leading to burnout. And as you mentioned, pandemia has taught us a lot of things. So for instance, many times, I include myself when I was the head of human resources, we work, we focus on the individuals, on the employees, but from the neck up, we focus on their mind, on their cognitive training, on their technical skills training. But more and more we learn, and I bring a lot from the science of happiness, how it's important as we, we focus on the spiritual aspect. And in spiritual, I mean uh, being mindful of that moment, what we are doing, to bring out our strengths. Because whenever we work with something we are passionate about, or we do it well, naturally, we create an upward spiral of growth. We wanted to do it again. And as we do it again, we become better. And as we become better, we have more fun. So those things we need to focus on the spiritual aspect, on the uh, physical aspect, exercise brings us energy, but also nutrition, the importance of our sleep, our relations. The biggest contributor to happiness is our relations and not the amount of connections we have, but the deepest, the intimate relationships that bring us 
uh, the importance of happiness, a fulfilling life. And finally, the emotional aspects. Many times at organizations, we need to show we are always strong, we are doing well, uh, and we need to give ourselves permission to be human, to acknowledge that we are not well that day. So those things are so important to walk hand in hand with the intellectual aspect. Well, my mind's exploding now because I got all sorts of different. I, 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 so I want to take the business world and put it inside the locker room for a second. Because in the locker room, that's when the coach gets in your face, good, bad, or ugly. In the office, sometimes the office space, it gets nasty versus coaching. How do you help people know the difference? How, how, how do people know how to challenge them, get in their face, but keep it happy, keep it fun? like coaches do. Coaches always will challenge you, but they also will kick you in the butt and say, go back, go get them. Come on, guys. How do you do that back in the business yes. world? There is a, let me start from a different point. Okay. When you wrote this book, Sport and Stage for Life, there is a picture here with my father, as you can see. Mm -hmm. And I call my father a beautiful enemy. I started my, uh, this book sharing a moment that when I was six years old, my father was waking up, uh, was waking me up and say, Chris, come on, it's time, let's go. And he would take me to the beach to see the sun, sunrise, to get ready to talk it with a lifeguard, to share with him what we are about to do. And he would take me swimming. At, until a certain point, he's, he was like, look, Chris, we are beyond the surfers. So he would take me to a place, Rich, that I would never dare to go by myself. I didn't have the courage to do that. So he was, he is that person that he's both the beautiful, that he celebrates with me the things I'm doing, my milestones, he support me. And at the same time, he brings out harsh feedbacks, my blind spots. He pushes me out of the comfort zone and all of this with a authentic way that he wants the best from me. So that's the same thing when we talk about coaches in sport, we talk about leaders, how we can bring out the servant leader, that the leader that is there, not for himself, for praising, receiving the best salary, the best opportunities, but how he's taking care to bring the best out of people and how we, he can create a psychological safety environment so people can be vulnerable, can share when they don't agree with something, they can use their voice to express, to communicate something. So these are things that we learn from a father, from a parent, to the sport environment, into yes. the organizational setting. Well, and a good coach knows what button, buttons to push. They know where your success is. They know where your challenges are. And they know exactly how far to push you. And they also know where not to push you. Is that true in business too? Do, do, do you think executives and leaders in the business world know and understand, yes, you should push them, but don't go too far? I believe, Rich, that we need to talk more about that because there are a lot of uh, knowledge still that is based on no pain, no gain. You are going to learn only when you suffer, when you go through this. So I suffer a lot to conquer that position as a woman executive. And now the other women, they need to go through this as well. They need to go to these via cruces this hard moments, hard journey, and it's not necessarily true. Mm. How we can bring the genius of the end? Yes, we can create executives, we can push ourselves towards our limits, uh, see our blind spots, receive harsh feedback, but with kindness, in a nice way. So learning how to respect in the past, I remember when I joined the bank, the most important KPI, a measurement, was the efficient ratio. 
what was the expenses with the revenues. So they used to treat us like a machine, how efficient you were if you were producing a lot of things with minor mistakes. Nowadays, I think we compare more companies with an ecosystem like nature. Yep. There are different moments, different phases, and how you can create the right setting so people can flourish. I, I love that you got to the right setting. Again, coaches know they set you up for success by putting you in the right position, the right place, the, the right offense or defensive scheme. They want to get you in the right setting to do that. Sometimes in the business world, it seems like we're forcing you to be a square peg in a round hole instead of looking at what's best for the team. Is that starting to change? You think people are doing a better job of setting you up for success in the business world? Yes, Rich, for sure, because more and more we started seeing hard data. It's not a matter of feeling. For instance, before I did my book, I wrote with my father. I did a lot of, um, I identified the research that would demonstrate how we can work with excellence and also bringing all the support with a better, more wellness so what is the relationship among wellness to sustainable high performance? So the same way you need to focus of getting into the zone, having peak performance, you need to be very good in resting as well, how you need to recover your energy. So we are having more books talking about that, more hard data, more research. I have, uh, as you mentioned, I'm doing the first master in the science of happiness so we study philosophy theology we study psychology this week we are studying medicine neuroscience so everything related to the good life to the eudaimonia how aristotle would say so those things are bringing more data for the business world to learn as well because the studies tell us People don't quit because of lack of pay. They don't quit the job because of long hours or bad parking lots. They quit because their boss is a jerk. They burn out because they butt heads all the time. So you're leading me to the great question is, what is this happiness all about? And how important is happiness that the boss brings first and brings into the environment? How important is that? Google started a project that they wanted to identify what the best performance teams had in common. So they started analyzing, is that uh, seniority? No. Is that how many years they were in college, in doing masters, PhD? No. Is that how they were good in strategic thinking, charisma, uh, expressing themselves, everything? No, no, no. So what they found it happened in the best performer teams. They had an environment where they could express themselves. That's what later on a researcher, Amy Edmondson, created the psychological safety environment. That's a term that she has a book about that. So how we can create this environment, not only in companies, but in teams, in sport, inside our families. So people can be vulnerable and bring out their best to the table. So you're a certified happiness trainer. I am. So you go into corporate now and you go into situations and work with high level executives and you help them to learn how to lead, be strong, achieve the goal and have more fun doing it. Yes. We bring all these things together and it's interesting, Rich, because when I started, I would say after the pandemic, I will, still would present myself being an expert in happiness. Some companies were like, what? No, we are, we are not worried about happiness. We want to know about the money here, yeah. uh, how we gain more money, what we can do to that. But more and more, Rich, we are seeing people and leaders open to that. Because as you said, it's a matter of retention of the best employees. It's a matter of survival. So how they can retain and make a difference, a good impact out there. 
And everything starts with their own employees inside their own company. Because if they take care of their own teams, then their clients will be better respected, better treated, they will become more creative, they will foster better results and sustainable results. So what are some of these happiness things that you teach and train? Because for me, if I'm not having fun, if I'm not happy, I don't want to do it. So what are the things you teach and coach to help people bring that happiness into the work environment? The first thing I always start talking about the spiritual aspect that I say is not related to religion, even though religion is great to mm -hmm. have faith. But I'm much more talking about what's the meaning that you have trigger at this moment in life. We are not talking about the meaning in life. Why were you born at this phase in life? So in the past, my purpose was to be the best athlete in the world, then to be the best leader, the best executive, to have a family, to have money, then to become a better mom. Nowadays, how I can teach and lead people to be in a healthy way, their best selves. So how they connect with their meaning at the moment in life. Then I bring up the talk about strength. Because usually when you give a feedback to someone, it's always what is missing, what is their weaknesses, what they are not doing well. Right. And what leads to excellency are their strengths. For instance, a soccer player who is very good in front of the goal, he needs to be able to run, to get himself more in positions to score. So he needs to run. But the feedback cannot be focusing on running. He needs to focus on being in front of the goal and learning everything to put himself over there. So how we also start our uh, practice, our mind, creating neural pathways, looking at the positive things in life. Because if you only see the negative things in life, you become very good at that. Yes. Well, and... One of the best books I ever read, highly recommend everyone to go buy Strength Finders. Yeah. Strength Finders turned it all upside down because we do. We hear it from school through college to business. You know, Chris, you could do better at this. Chris, you know what? You're just not as good as Ted. And Ted over here is crushing. And Chris, I know you. And we, we get told over and over again the things we're bad about. Instead of Chris, you're great at this. And we build on the strengths. How important is that, do you think, for happiness, for fulfillment, for teamwork environment to lean on the strength factor? Which this is key because, again, when you are focused on the strengths and many people ask me, how do I find my strengths? Two ways. What you are passionate about. When I talk about with something with you about, for instance, media, the strategy, I can see you sit more up front you are interested in that and things that we do well naturally. So to share these things, to study the science of happiness is like the ball that was kicking on the court that I couldn't answer. How can I lead into a high performance environment, not bringing the burnout into that? And the answer was working in the science of happiness, working from inside out. So. Seeing our strengths is something that we connect with one thing that you use the term, we connect with our joy, with fun. And when we connect with something that makes us feel good, we feel like doing it again. And we start becoming better at that as we want to repeat. And happiness is contagious. To me, there's something important about celebration. And from all the businesses and teams, I've, I've, I've tried to lead with celebration. People look at me funny. It's like, Rich, it's not that big of a deal. And I think it is a big deal. I, I, I think leaders need to make it more of a celebration because I think it feeds the soul. I think it feeds the spirit as you were talking about. Who doesn't want to have a success? Um, there was one company that, that I was with, and for a while we made up stupid awards every friday someone got a silly duck award uh, for, for for the most creative idea you know we just came up with different and you, you know what happened chris was people began to look forward to these little silly awards at first they laughed at them 
But then it was like, I wonder who's getting the Duck Award. And, you know, you go by the desk and you see the Duck Award and people remember how they got the Duck Award. Do you think those are some of the things we should be doing? Is that part of this happiness training you get into? Yes, I think it's to acknowledge at these moments of celebration, as you said, is bring the positive things because many times we take it for granted, the good things. So it's like appreciation exercise that we are doing there. We are stopping and even in a fun way, as you mentioned, we bring what people did that sometimes they didn't even notice. Right. And if you don't stop and you, you don't acknowledge that, you just take it for granted. So this is very important also to create a good environment, a positive environment when you recognize the good acts. I want to go back to sport and self-awareness for a second. Because partly being in athletics, you have to be self-aware of yourself, your mental state, your physical state. There's so much you have to be self-aware of besides the team. How important is that in the business world? Do we have to be more self-aware? And, and do we do a good in the job of that in how we train, uh, onboard people, things like that? Definitely not. This is something, as I mentioned, we focus a lot, many times in the technical hard skills, focusing, practicing our intellectual aspect, and we forget the rest. So how we bring the importance of noticing our emotions and emotions, they are not good or bad, they are emotions. And how we train to acknowledge our emotions and respond in the best way, not to react. So how you bring that emotion that you are feeling and you behave in the best way. So these things we need to talk about it and bring, for instance, Gallup, you should have a question when they do the surveys with employees that they ask, do you have a best friend at work? And many times executives say, come on, take it out this question. Work is not a place to have a best friend. But this answer had a lot of correlation, a high correlation with satisfaction among the employees. Because whenever you have someone that you trust at work, that you can have a good time, that you can celebrate something, again, we said, this is a positive, it's a joyful environment that it becomes contagious. It impacts positively other people. It impacts the way you talk with a client, with a supplier, when you develop something. So the long hours you stay in an office at work, oh, you yeah. start creating a better environment. So you start bringing more joy into that. I love it. I love it. And I do want to shift here. You, you, you do have a great book, A Stage for Life, How to Connect with the Touchstone of Elite Performance and Personal Fulfillment. And as we mentioned that, you do have a free gift for everybody, as we mentioned earlier. What's the free gift? What do they get when they hit the QR code? Yes, I would like, love to offer to all of you who, I, who is listening to us my ebook. I wrote this book with my father. It's a very meaningful project from the first to the last page. So I would love you to have it. And please, if you like it, leave it a review. Uh, tell me what you like the most, what it touched your heart. This is the biggest present that I received from the readers. What you really connected when you read my book. Hit the QR code, scan that, go in, give all the proper information. And the book will be zipped up absolutely free. And believe me, you do want to read this because this topic is very important as we've been talking about. We do want to be high achievers. We, we do want to perform really well. But for many of us, the burnout factor is so real now. We're pushing and pushing. And I love the fact that you teach happiness. You teach people how to have fun at work again. And I think, at least in America, that's got pulled out of the corporate world so long ago. It's good to hear it's coming back. So someday, are you going to be the champion of happiness in the world? Are you going to be the happiness champion? I hope that I am already am. <laughs> I advocate and I bring the happiness with high performance. So this reach is very strong. I remember when I started uh, studying the science of happiness, 
the phrase permission to be human for me was so liberating, was so strong because I was taught as a high performance athlete, always to be at my best, uh, to endure all the pain that my body had and still be at my best over there. So to give ourselves permission to be human, to learn how we channel what we are feeling, our emotions, and respond to the best way to the situation. And there are moments that we need to be in silence. We need to focus on recovering our energy. We need to be listening mindfully to a music. We need to be back in nature. And then when we take care of ourselves, we can get into the high performing stage the way we want. So that's what I'm focusing a lot, showing people, yes, how it's possible, happiness and excellence at the same time. Chris, as we wind down, I'm kind of interested in your, your, your father was instrumental in everything you did and the championships, the love of water polo, breaking the stereotypes of the gender with water polo. And now you have we team and he's still actively involved in everything you do. How important is your father to your overall success? Rich, it's interesting because when I wrote my book, my main goal was to share the mentality, the mindset, how high performance athletes take care of themselves, the integral being to perform at their best. But the feedback that I received the re from the readers, they say, Chris, your book is a love letter to your father. Yes. It brings a lot the relationship from a father, how he can bring out the best in their child, but bringing morality, the ethical aspect, the fair game, the fair aspect of the game. So all these things, sport was our common ground. It was a way that our family had to bond, to talk about uh, resolve conflicts, different point of views, to be taken beyond our limits, to celebrate, as you mentioned. So we learned that in sport and how sport told us how to be part of a team, that we do need a team to be at our best, yeah. even in individual sports, how we face adversities, how it's so hard, for instance, parents to see their children suffering and going through a difficult moment when they lose a game, when they are not called for a, a team at their school, but how they learn from that. So those things I learned later on, the same thing in the corporate environment. And my father is a person that is always supporting me to be at my best. And even at my own company, we team, he's one always uh, cheering for me, wishing my best, and together with my mom, that my mom reached, I told you, she was the first director of Women's Water Polo, and she won the highest achievement of all. My father and I, my brothers, we never won that. It's called Paragon Award. They give this award for people who, who do an extraordinary contribution for the worldwide in sport. And she was one of the good advocates for women's water polo to be at the Olympic Games. Chris Pensaroli, fantastic. Your family, your history, your love of sports, and congratulations on your success after championships, after sport. Thanks for everything you're doing in the business world and helping people bring joy and fulfillment back to the business world. Thank you very much. Rich, thank you. Thank you for this talk. Well, again, sports, athletes, business, high achievement, and teamwork. It all goes together. And again, Chris has done that so exquisitely. Chris Pensaroli. And again, you want to get the book, make sure you get a hold of that. She also has other information. We're going to put in the show notes. You better have to go check out some of her YouTube material, some of her other writings, check out her website. You want to follow up and learn a lot more about what she's doing. And she, again, the certified happiness trainer. Maybe she'll come to your business. Maybe she'll come and reach out to you and you can learn about more about what she is doing in the world of business and life. All this is made possible, by the way, by our wonderful sponsors at 
Audavito Studios. Audavito Studios is going to help this show get transferred into an audio podcast now. And that will be distributed to many different platforms. They can do the same thing for you. Audavito's experienced team with their state-of-the-art technology will take your audiobook, your podcast series, and convert it and help you grow it and grow it. To learn more, go to audavita.com. That's going to do it for this edition of Rock to Stage. We'll be back next Wednesday night, as always, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We bring amazing guests, celebrities, global experts like we did here tonight. And we have a great in-depth con- con- <laughs> conversation, often unscripted, often personal, but always on point. We'll see you back here next week for How the Rock to Stage, 7 p.m. Eastern time.